Sure. I think that interventions for suicidal thinking need to be at an individual level, but also a family level, also a community level, including schools and healthcare centers, and then at a state level. So I think in terms of the question you're asking, one of the important things is that when someone's having suicidal ideation, that they don't ignore it. That somebody doesn't just kind of put the thought out of their head or try to ignore that they're having it. It's always a serious indication that something is very, very wrong. And so the people need to be willing to address I'm, I'm in a place where I'm thinking about hurting myself. What do I do now? I think it's very important for friends, community members, families to be willing to talk about suicidality and suicide. Um, it's never bad to ask, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? People don't like to say those words. They're not comfortable words to say. But most people who commit suicide have told somebody and have talked about their thoughts about death and dying. And giving someone a non-judgmental forum to talk about suicide can be all it takes to get them connected with the help they need as opposed to continuing to walk down the hopeless path of suicide. So I think that having individuals respond to their own thoughts, their families being open to talk with them, sometimes you have to ask. Uh, with teenagers, you'll see changes in behavior that may not indicate suicidality, but they'll go from perhaps being social to being isolated, being a happy kid to being very mean, uh, irritable, in your face kind of kid, or they go from getting good grades to getting bad grades. And sometimes we have to ask, what's going on? What's, what is really going on? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? And it, it feels bad to ask a 14-year-old that, but kids do kill themselves. Even very young children kill themselves. So we have to be willing to talk about it. And then we have to have, at a community level, agencies that are willing to take those people on. So the schools have to know where to get the kids when their friends tell that they're thinking about hurting themselves. Or the VA has to have the, the staff available around the clock to get people the care they need. So when we have an opportunity to intervene, we don't miss it. I think perhaps some people think, oh, if I ask them about it, if I say the word suicide, that'll uh, put a thought into their mind if they're not having it, or it will trigger them to take an action that they were just sort of, maybe weren't very serious about. But what you're saying is that that's not really the case. That's one of the myths of suicide, is that if you ask about it, that you'll trigger it in somebody. If What we find is that if you ask somebody who's not suicidal, if they're not suicidal, they'll just tell you, no, I haven't had thoughts like that. You're not going to trigger this reaction. But that people are so afraid to talk about it that it feels shameful, or like the person needs to hide it because no one's willing to communicate about it. So it is in a very non-judgmental way, you know, we don't want to say like, well, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Or you wouldn't do that, would you? Are you having thoughts about hurting yourself? Have you thought about doing anything extreme because of the stress you're having? You know, using non-judgmental language and giving them time to talk. Sure. You might ask veteran specific questions. Yes, absolutely. I yeah, answer the question of Cameron. <laughs> when veteran, veterans have the issues that we're talking about, what does the VA have to offer 24 7, 365? What's here, when, speaking specifically to veterans and veteran families who recognize these issues, uh, why don't you explain that? So, probably the easiest to access is the Veterans Crisis Line. We have a 24 hour, seven day a week crisis line that people can call from wherever they are. Um, you don't have to be suicidal, you can be in emotional distress, you can use that line. We have our ER which is staffed with social workers around the clock who are trained to deal with suicidality and suicidal crises. We have our mental health clinic. We have a number of separations. I'm with the general mental health clinic. We have a substance abuse clinic. We have an OEF clinic. We've got uh, people who work with serious mental illness. We've got an inpatient unit. So we have a lot of services here um, during the business day, but we do have around the clock access to care. Um, suicide prevention is a particularly important goal to the VA uh, because veterans often, because of what they saw, because of sometimes of maybe traumatic brain injuries or PTSD, have a higher rate of, of suicide than the general public. Um, is it difficult for you to address that with them? Because I think there's also this idea of machismo that comes with uh, the service a lot of times. Uh, are they reluctant to talk about it? Not as a rule. I don't find, I find that people who are suicidal 
are often very confused by their own experience. They have these very hopeless thoughts. They have feelings that are scary to them. And to have someone that's willing to talk through it with you and to help you think about why you're feeling that way and why your thinking might be off or why your perception might be skewed. One of the important things is suicidality is often associated with mental health problems, mental health diagnoses. And these diagnoses alter your thinking. People who are depressed think differently than people who are not. People who are diagnosed with anxiety disorders think differently. And so we have to make sure that their thinking is clear. People will feel hopeless. They'll feel like a burden. They'll, these are risk factors for suicide, feeling hopeless, feeling like a burden. And when we find someone who's a, maybe a grandpa who feels like a burden, if we explore with them their relationships, we find that they really know that their family loves them, but they just lost touch with that. And their family would never see them as a burden. Even if they're a little bit older and walk a little bit slower, we don't see them as a burden. But their mind got it twisted that, they, that there's nothing good in the future or that people don't love them. You talked about uh, directly addressing it in terms of talking to people who, who you suspect may be experiencing suicidal ideation. Are there other actions that are good to take um, and I ask specifically, are there things that should be considered to be removed from the house? Uh, we'll say firearms, for example, or maybe um, uh, narcotics, if they have, um, if they're a pain patient, then you can't I assume. But um, are there things like that that you counsel family members on, or even patients themselves? Yes. Uh, we do do risk reduction with patients who are high risk for suicide. Things like that will be um, issuing gun locks to people so they have a, a gun lock for, their, for the weapons if they're in the home, uh, removing alcohol, encouraging the, the person to be sober. Alcohol is involved with a great deal of suicides. And so we know that we want them to reduce that risk. We ask them to increase their social support, make time to go spend time with the people that you love. Um, but if you do have lethal substances or a weapon in the home, you might consider during the increased risk period removing those from the home so they're not immediately available. Um, that's exactly what my next question is going to be. Some of the reading I've done on this has talked about um, a significant percentage of suicides that are considered impulsive, I guess. So the, the time between, okay, I'm going to kill myself and the action can be as little as five minutes or an hour. And if you have a gun 10 feet away in your gun cabinet, it's very easy to make that decision quickly because um, you don't have to go out and get anything. You don't have to set up a ligature. You know, mm -hmm. you just grab a gun. Um, that wasn't a question, but imagine that there was a question mark on the end of that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I work with veterans, and as a rule, veterans like guns. And so what, we talk, what I talk about with my veterans is the pros and the cons of certain things that they have in their home, the pros and the cons of alcohol consumption when they're in this state of mind. And so, of course, as my preference as a psychologist, if someone is acutely suicidal, if someone is depressed, if someone is suffering from significant PTSD symptoms, we do want the weapons out of the house. Uh, we, I've had people give them to their brothers. I've had people give them to a trusted other gun owner and just say, hey, hold on to these. Um, I, I would broaden this for other people who are gun owners who might have someone in the house who would use their weapon. We know a lot of times in suicides and crime, it's somebody else's gun. It's, it's a legally owned gun, but somebody else is using it that shouldn't have access to it. And so if you have any kind of elevated risk of, fam of violence in your family, I would say we have to be very careful with our guns. Um, it's all about stopping the impulsive behavior and not giving someone it, uh, access to maybe an immediate avenue that they don't have a way back from. But I always want it to be the veteran's decision. Sure. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about the impulsivity? And like I said, I, I have academic papers that I've read about it, but it'd be nice to have an expert. Um, I think it's hard for people to imagine because I don't want to say there's a romanticized version, but there's a, this image we have in our head of what a suicide looks like, and it's 
I made a decision, I'm going to write a note, I'm going to lay out my things, I'm going to make oblique references to loved ones, and then I'm going to do it. But it's not really how that happens a lot of times. It happens, you've made a decision, and then there's an action. Um, I guess, from your experience, what would you say the rate of impulsivity is, and can you just kind of give people a sense of how important it is to not have things that you could make that decision, make, take that action with immediately, the means, uh, right at hand. So I don't think the period walking up to a suicide is impulsive. Most of the research shows us that people talk about it, think about it, mull it over. Um, you know, of course, rarely we might have something happen where somebody has an extreme event and says, nope, I'm done. But the vast majority of people do uh, think about it, have ideation for a long time before they make a plan. When somebody's at the plan stage, that's when we are in trouble and that's when things can start moving very quickly. So I think three times more people have suicidal ideation than commit suicide. So there's a little bit more suicidal ideation than there is people who getting into the planning and execution stage. But we get into trouble when we've come into the plan. And when the plan is something very, very lethal, like opioids, weapons, hanging, if somebody makes a split decision once they've got to that level, it can happen very fast. Um, some of these methods are incredibly lethal. There's nothing we can do. Uh, some of these, I think w some of the high profile suicides lately um, in the music industry have appeared very impulsive, although there were longer term problems going on. Uh, so we do need to reduce the risk by not having things in the house that could potentially if somebody gets into a bad state of mind, help them carry out something that a few hours later, a day later, they would not carry out. Um, you talked about when they get to the plan stage, it's, it's very serious. Um, I don't know how often suicidal people share their plans with loved ones. Obviously, you said that they usually talk about it or make references or what might be seen as a, a cry for help or just saying, hey, I'm, I'm in trouble. Um, is there a point at which between the suicidal thought, the intent, I guess, and then the plan, um, where, I don't like the phrase, things should be taken seriously, because I think they should probably always be taken seriously, but like you said, if nine million people think about suicide, only three million will make a plan, and only one point five percentage of that mm -hmm. will actually do it, you know? Right. I guess when, when should immediate action be taken? Um, not just, we're going to talk about this, but we're going to talk about this and then I'm going to take your gun tonight. Mm -hmm. So in, in mental health, we think that immediate action needs to be taken when there's a plan and when there's intent, or when there's intent without a f fully formed plan but strong intent. And so we do have to have conversations with people about where their mind is, what their thoughts are. Do you want to die? Do you think this is the only way out? Do you think this is the only solution? And so when somebody gets the sense that a person has a plan, and there can be tells if we watch, you know, that maybe the gun case hasn't been open in four years and it's been opened. Or maybe there hasn't been alcohol around the house for a long time and the person starts drinking or they're not taking their pain pills, right? And they're piling up sort of thing. So you, you can watch for those types of things, but um, when they have a plan and they have intent, that's when we, we need to mobilize action that sometimes makes people unhappy. Hi, you've done a good job and so have you. I, the one thing I would say is that um, in my experience in the VA that it's not the time for people closest to the person don't ignore the signs kind of a thing. And you can speak to that. Is it, many times it's the, a family member that brings them to the ER. Um, they, they're the one. So it's always, it's not to expecting the suicidal person, the person with suicidal ideations to present and say, I'm like that, are, are probably not as great as others. Other people will notice that. If you want to speak to 
how, how important it is for friends and family and, and uh, support groups to pay attention. So I, I think that's a good point. So people may not communicate directly that they're having suicidal ideation, that they're thinking about killing themselves, they will, but they might show that there's something different. Their behavior changes, their mood changes, they're obviously struggling. Uh, there's signs of the struggle that people who know them well enough can see. And that's the point where I think people should feel comfortable saying, are you thinking about hurting yourself? You don't need a note, they don't need to be given away their prized possessions. If somebody is struggling, it's fine to ask. And you know, most of the time, the person's gonna say no and they're gonna genuinely mean it. And so fine, you asked a question, you got an answer, you're good. Uh, we ask everybody, every time we see them here, whether they have suicidal ideation or not. And that is because you never know when you're gonna catch the one who you don't expect. Uh, people don't expect 16 year olds to think about killing themselves. People don't expect people in college who are, have bright futures to kill themselves. So that's why we have to ask regardless of whether we, exp we, whether we suspect it. Don't trust your judgment, just ask. And then you've done the best that you can. Uh, they don't have to tell you the truth, but at least you asked and gave them the opportunity to tell